Hello and wel welcome to lesson four. Want to uh, say Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays. I uh, hope you have a great new year. Hope that this week you enjoy um, maybe being off work a day or two. That'd be great, wouldn't it? And um, being with your family, uh, going to church and worshiping the Lord. Uh, we are dealing with lesson four this morning. Uh, it's Tuesday morning again. It's cold out there. I'm having to wear my big boy coat today. But um, lesson four, here is your king. We are following Jesus to the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, as he uh, deals with Peter, who denied him three times, and Jesus restored him. He reclaimed him as a person and reclaimed his ministry. So, um, and the point is, we're all in that business. We should be Christ like and restoring people because we all mess up, sometimes bigger than other times, but we're all frail creatures of dust. And um, today we're in John chapter 19, 5 through 16. And uh, the main idea is that the danger of mob mentality is that in the moment, wrong can seem right. And, um, yeah, that's how it is. Uh, I don't know what it is about human nature, but um, in a crowd, sometimes we can be prone to do things that we wouldn't normally do. And that's exactly what happened. Now, I... I got to tell you, I think these are two different groups of people. I think the people that were there when Jesus came into the city and rode that little cute donkey, um, that's a whole different group of people than those that were standing out there out beside Pilate saying, crucify him. So, yeah, um, just park that in your mind. Uh, the question to explore is, do I always stand for the truth? And where the curriculum writer was coming from is somebody should have stood up for Jesus. You would think the 12 and these thousands of people that followed Jesus around for years, somebody would have stood up for him and said, this is wrong. But when you're standing up to the establishment, it's a difficult thing to do. And you had two. You had the Jewish religious establishment. And you had the Roman uh, government, military. And so sometimes that's easier said than, than done. We all know about bureaucracy, don't we? And uh, all of that. I've got to go pay my taxes uh, sometime this week. And I dread going over there. I always pay it in person just to make sure they get it in their hot little hands. But um, anyway... Um, so let's introduce the lesson. Um, first thing I, I noted is that Jesus is still being tried in the court of public opinion. That's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Um, and he's before Pilate. And you've got this going on where Pilate's trying to figure out why are they so mad at this guy? And uh, you've got the Jewish leaders that are manipulating him to get what they want. They, they can't go kill him himself. If they could, they would have. They would have stoned him for blasphemy. And so um, they want what they want, but they can't do it themselves. And so they're using uh, the system to get what they want. And so that's a very terrible place to be for Jesus. Uh, remember that Jesus uh, was basically crucified and he was dead before Passover began at sundown on Friday. If they left those Jewish prisoners up on those crosses during Passover, there would be a riot. And people would be angry about it because, you know, it was sacrilege, you know. They can go and crucify Jesus, uh, you know, on wrong that never happened. But to leave him up there past Passover, oh, that's a terrible thing. So uh, they had to get him down before Passover began on Friday. And so uh, this is basically happening on Thursday. So, Thursday night. <laughs> uh, so here we go. Let's uh, look at the text. I've divided it up in three different passages. First one is uh, the Jewish leaders accused Jesus of blasphemy. What's so funny about that is um, 
the Romans didn't care about that. They weren't religious. They they worshipped everything, you know. Um, and they're kind of like, we're not going to kill him for that. You know, we're not going to give him capital punishment for what you say is blas blasphemous, okay? So they, um, Pilate begins, to, he's still questioning Jesus. Now, I tell you, this is unique. John, the Apostle John, the Gospel of John, has these beautiful, big, long conversations of Jesus with people. You see it with Nicodemus. You see it with the woman at the well. Uh, you see it here. It's unique to the book of John. And um, John includes those because he was there and he heard them. He saw it. So... Um, Anyway, the second passage is, um, well, the first one is the leaders accuse him of blasphemous. The second, that's 5 through 8a. Uh, Pilate questions Jesus again, and we see that conversation. That's 8b through 11. And then the Jewish leaders kind of change their charge to insurrection. Well, oh, that gets the Romans' attention then, and they finally have a charge that will stick. So let's look at those three passages. And... Um, and go from there. You know, the whole point of this study is leading up to when Jesus goes and meets Peter on the shore and restores his ministry, restores him as a person, and says, you know, if you really love me, then go feed my sheep, okay? Go do what I've called you to do. Uh, yeah, you messed up, but it's not to the point of me just throwing you under the bus, okay? All right, here we go. John chapter 19, 5 through 8a. When Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe, purple is always a symbol of royalty, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him, knowing that they can't do that. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. That's blasphemous in their eyes. You know, uh, you're saying you're one with, with, with Yahweh, and uh, that can't be. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. So he is really in a very difficult place. He doesn't really um, see what the issue is with Jesus. He's not really a threat. Who's he a threat to? He's a threat to the Jewish leaders because he confronted them many, many times, and they're just not having it, okay? The other gospel accounts mention that uh, Pilate's wife had a dream and cautioned him against uh, harming Jesus. And so... Um, Yes, you know, I've said it before, the Egyptian early Coptic church believed that Pilate and his wife both became believers later. Wouldn't that be awesome to get to heaven and Pilate's there? We will see, won't we? Well, he's trying to figure out, how do I get out of this one? How do I not crucify this guy? How do I not execute capital punishment on him? and um, keep the peace because the Jews, boy, if they're anything, they're kind of hot-blooded people and they riot. They resented the Roman government and Roman military even being on their property. This is God's gift to us. We should be self-ruled. We should have a king like David and uh, not like this. This is not God's will for us and we don't like it. And so they don't like the Romans one little bit. And Pilate is there to keep the peace, make sure everybody pays their taxes, things move along, okay? Uh, they're threatening that. And he's, he's trying to navigate this very difficult circumstance for him. Well, let's look at the second passage where he goes back in and he speaks again to Jesus. Uh, he has this conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. It's been going on for a while now. Where do you come from? <laughs> it's a good question. He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. And um, Jesus knows what's going on. 
He's all-knowing, okay? This is not a big shock to Jesus. Nothing is, and nothing was. And uh, Pilate says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Which technically he did, but this is Jesus, this Son of God. He's the creator of the universe. Uh, you don't have no power over him. Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Boy, that's an understatement, isn't it? Um, Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Now, he's not talking about the Father. You know, he's talking about the Jewish leaders. Okay? Um, you know, Jesus is not mad at Pilate. Pilate is... I don't think Jesus is even mad at the Jewish leaders, really. Now, they were being misfits and liars, but this is all part of God's plan. Jesus knows that, and he's submitting to it for our benefit. Well, let's read the last. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. Yep, he did. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend to Caesar. Now, you talk about hypocrites. My goodness, they could not stand the Roman government. They uh, were not loyal to the Roman government. They couldn't stand them. So, let's read on. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat him down and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which is in Aramaic in Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. See, once everything happened during Passover, people weren't moving about. So if you got business to do to get ready for the Passover or anything, you better get it done before Passover, because it ain't happening after that. Walmart is closed, okay? It's not going to be open. So you better get it taken care of. Um... Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? He's like, These people are crazy. Uh, Pilate asked, We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Very sad. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Man. Those soldiers were not as uh, nice to Jesus as Pilate was. Um, they thought it was their job to beat him up, and basically they beat him to death, which is awful, 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 awful. Well, so we're following Jesus to the cross. That would probably be the next few lessons. So let's look at some truths in this sad story. First one is anger is a dangerous emotion that needs to be kept in check. Um, you ever been angry about something and you're just not thinking right? Uh, in your anger, you might say or do something that you normally wouldn't do. I think that's a little bit of what the curriculum writers is playing off of in this passage. And I, anger is a, is a terrible thing. You know, one of the spirits is self, uh, fruits of the spirit is self-control. If you've got the spirit, you've got self-control. You should be able to keep your anger in check and work through that in a Christ-like way. Jesus did. He could have called down angels and destroyed the whole lot of them. But he kept his, his emotions in check. So be careful about your anger. Keep your uh, Learn to keep your mouth closed and let go of, of anger. You can't bottle it up. You can't keep it inside. Let it go. Uh, even when you're right. Okay. So uh, anger is a dangerous, dangerous emotion that needs to be kept in check. Second point is public opinion shouldn't be the believer's true gauge of truth. God's word is. Um, you know, we live in a world where it seems like public opinion rules everything, even when it's wrong. Um, you know, I know where that is. The root of all of that is, is sin and people not uh, trusting God's word and believing his truth like I do. But it is sad to see. And I do think it's getting worse because of mass communication. 
So uh, be careful to weigh out public opinion and make sure that our gauge of truth is God's word and not something we read on Facebook or wherever else we things we read. Last thing is again, here we go again, Jesus was the true Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Uh, when Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist, that's exactly what he said. He says, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's really what this passage is about and that's really what's going on. God's going to take the sins of all the world, past, present, and future. Put it on Jesus on that cross. He's going to be our great atonement. Um, he's what he's going to bring us closer to God than we are because of our sin. So uh, park that in your mind and uh, remember that as we read uh, forward and move forward with the rest of this. Trust you have a great week. Um, going to enjoy my kids and my grandkids and we're going to have Mexican food at our house. So <laughs> no turkey and dressing this time. That's good. Let me pray with you. Jesus, we love you. We love each other. And I thank you for your great atoning sacrifice once and for all. Lord, thank you for your great gift of grace. I thank you that just as you offered forgiveness to Peter, you offer it to us. Help us to learn from your sacrifice. Help us to control our anger, to control our sin, and to follow you. We love you. We thank you for uh, coming and giving yourself. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Trust you have a great week. Merry Christmas again. See you at church Sunday or whenever I see you. Take care.